Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name Podcast. Uh, we are talking about an iconic game uh, today, as we always do. But today is even more iconic, Tim, to a certain extent, because arguably it was uh, played on the new St. Patrick's Day, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, none shall sleep during the course of this podcast, because we are... Going all the way back to Italian 90, a great day in the life of Italy and the recently departed Toto Scalacci, and a great day in the history of Irish football, and a great day in the life of Paddy Barkley, who mm -hmm. was fortunate enough to be in the Olympic Stadium in Rome for yeah. this game. Mm. Legendary. A legendary Patrick Barkley. <laughs> Forgive me, Paddy. I'm just like trying to uh, re uh, well represent you because yeah. I thought. Uh, Tim undersold you somewhat. So we're talking about the legendary... Well, well that's Patrick. you, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is clearly there's some history between you and Vickery. We'll come yeah. to that. Uh, but uh, well, um, luckily, luckily, there's geography as well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'll keep you apart. But, you know, you're, you're proper sporting um, yeah. or sports yeah. writing legend, I should oh, say, for yeah. many papers, all the great papers from The mm -hmm. Times, The Telegraph, The Independent and so on. Yeah. So yeah. it really is a pleasure to have you with us. So take us there. 30th of June, 1990, mm -hmm. Italian 90. Yeah. Italy, uh, the home team uh, against Lowly Island, uh, yeah. managed by the one and only Jack Charlton. Uh, yeah. Talk us through it. What do you remember? Well, not not so much low, lowly Ireland, um, because uh, I mean many great tournament memories um, for me. I was a, you know like Tim's a current journalist. I was a journalist at that time, a sports writer, football writer, and I, I had great memories <laughs> of travelling with Jack Charlton's Ireland or going to matches. I mean, not just because I'm Scottish, but 1988 where they they knocked. Well, they, they began the unhinging of England uh, in the European Championship by winning um, through a goal. I think, I think it was uh, Ray Houghton, mm. who is Scottish, yeah, as everybody knows. <laughs> yes, we and, could hear uh, that in the way he spoke. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But uh, no, they, you know, I mean, obviously, lowly. They, 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 they compared with the tournament favourites and hosts, Italy. Yeah, certainly. But it was a wonderful. You know, I've got lots of great memories of Ireland. I mentioned 1988 when they beat England, uh, 1990, which we're talking about now, and of course, 1994, the great day in the Giant Stadium, where they actually beat Italy. But let's take each episode as it comes. And and it, I, I, what I can remember most, I don't. I've had to refresh my memory a bit about the game, but uh, the atmosphere was fantastic, and it was a, it was an education really to see so many Irish fans in there uh, uh, at the Stadio Olimpico. I think fifteen thousand Irish fans, and the thing I, I can still remember, and it still makes me a little bit emotional, the way they uh, respected the uh, Italian anthem. Well, I, I was used to ill-mannered crowds from England booing uh, opposing anthems and, and and even Scotland you know booing the English uh, the British anthem uh, so it was just wonderful to see 15,000 Irish fans respectfully holding up their banners as a salute I, I, I remember I, I can still see it now um, and, and being absolutely silent you know um, while the uh, Italian anthem was played, and of course, then belting out their own um, with uh, considerable gusto. It was a great atmosphere. It was a wonderful, wholesome atmosphere. And, um, uh, you know, then the, the game began, and, 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 you know, Ireland, as so often in, in big tournaments, acquitted themselves well. Yeah. It it was one of those, uh, when you mentioned 15,000 Irish fans, it sounds yeah. like a lot, but not when they've been virtually um, not drowned out, but I, yeah. I would argue that they were drowned out by 60,000 yeah. yeah. Italian fans. Um, so it wasn't a fan home or an Irish away fan advantage for no. the Irish as it might have been if it was Scotland, was it? 
No, no, it, it, it wasn't. They were still, yeah, very much in the minority. And, and the atmosphere, I mean, again, I can, you know, it's as if I was back there. Um, the atmosphere really was, you know, almost, almost, tact, almost touchable, tangible. And, um, but wholesome, you know, it, it, it was good. And um, I felt actually watching the match again, being reminded of it, the Italians, uh, if you look at all the, the match reports, the Irish journalists were always saying, you know, every time an Irish player so much as looked at an Italian, uh, you know, the referee, who I think was Portuguese, uh, gave a foul. Well, I'm sorry, but that's the laws of the game, you know. I, I, <laughs> yes. I, could, not see, yes. I could not see a single bloody foul in that game that wasn't that was incorrectly given that that, that, that piece of journalism hasn't hasn't aged very well has no, it that, that but the one. irish the thing is that uh, the irish all never get beaten fair and square never <laughs> um i remember uh, okay celtic is not irish but uh, you know when celtic got beaten by porto in the one of the european you know it was the same again you know porto were diving this that and the other well they were a, a wee bit they were only diving because that was the only way they could get fouls and get free kicks. And it was this, it's the same in this game. The tactics were obviously to just go in that, not viciously, but marginally late all the time on the Italians. And uh, the referee didn't let them get away with it. So um, that was good. But no, no, they, they never lose fair and square. And to be quite honest, when Thierry Henry did that thing in Paris, I thought, right, this time you've got a case. This, at long last, you've actually got a case and you're not going to get away with it. So, well, handball, caught him red-handed, so to speak. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. But, yeah. But, but on that occasion, they were hard done by it, but it was the only one. I've spent much of that month in, because uh, I've, nev I've never been to Italy. In fact, I only put that one right a year ago. Um, but effectively in Italy, in Soho, in this, it was a lovely little little Italian cafe <laughs> that was called, funny. Uh, called Il Panino uh, on Archer Street. When I found mm. out it, it meant the sandwich, I was somewhat disappointed. Uh, <laughs> it, 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 it was owned by this fella from Cagliari who ended up losing it because he gambled it. He gambled it away on the, on the casino the other side of Archer Street. But I spent mm. pr pretty much the whole month there. And the only people who went in were, were Italians. And they were all male, apart from the games. The games were so packed. And I remember how jittery they were about this game. Remember, it's their World Cup. It's Italy's World Cup. They're at home. They're the favourites. Mm. It's a strange World Cup for them because they start off with the idea that the hero is going to be Viali. It's Viali mm. and Mancini, the, 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 the duo from, from Sampdoria. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't work. So during the course of the World Cup, they discover another attack. You know, with, yeah. with Baggio and also obviously with Scalacci, who yeah. was, was a reserve who'd come from nowhere and ended up just having the month of his life. But also, they were just having a, a huge attack of nerves the whole time. The yeah. round before, they played Uruguay. And they, they I think it was, it was a 2-0 victory. And Uruguayans, they hardly crossed the halfway line. But I remember the, the headline, because I used to try and read the, you know, the Gazeta del Sport and, and, and so on in, in, in this cafe. And it was all epic battle against the Uruguayans. And you're thinking, well, how are they going to react when it gets really more serious? And yeah. against Ireland, because Italian football, one of the, the, the dominant strains behind the kind of the history of Catanaccio and, and so on, one of the dominant strains behind it is an idea that they were... In, they were not strong, not strong to cope with the Northern Europeans. Mm. Uh, Il Bruto del Norte, you know, the brute of the North, yeah. the ugly yeah. one of the North. How yeah. on earth can we, can, can we cope? Uh, and and uh, the ultra defensive tradition is part, is part of that. And then along come Ireland, who made no concessions to aesthetics at all. This really was, it was... Il Bruto del Norte incarnate. Mm -hmm. And they were really, really jittery. I also have a theory that Baresi, the great defender, would rather play against Romario, the great Brazilian, yeah. than Niall Quinn and Tony Cascarino. 
oh, who, would, yeah. who would put him in a, in a oh. physical battle. So oh, the atmosphere oh. that I was getting was just this one of, of a nation, Italy, on the verge of a nervous breakdown against a nation, Ireland, that was just enjoying the crack. Yeah, yeah. You're absolutely right. The, uh, Ireland looked confident during that. There was a moment um, during the game. They certainly weren't cowed at all <clears throat> in any way, shape or form. And there was a moment, uh, I think it was towards the end of the, when was the goal? 29, 39, something like that? 39, 39. 39. So it must have been just before that. And Ireland had a corner. And uh, as the corner was won, Niall Quinn had one of those little knowing grins on his face. We're, we're, we're getting on top here. We're going to. We're, we're not going to lose. And and a few of the players said afterwards, you know, we we never envisaged losing this game, you know. And <clears throat> well, of course, I mean, what happened later was that they let uh, a few minutes later was that they let it, Italy break on them. It was a really good counter attack. And then, you know, Paki Bonner was a very very good goalkeeper, but. Uh, on this occasion, he, he, he did that thing that bad goalkeepers do, which was parry in the wrong direction. I mean, it was he should have got an assist for that, Bonner, you know, because <laughs> he, he could have touched it around the post. He wasn't asking like, for an assist, so... And he, pulls it, he pulls it back into um, Scalacci's path. And mm. honestly, uh, I wouldn't have scored it, but I think you might, Tim. I think you uh, might have. No, I'd, I'd have, I'd have uh, the pressure would have got to me. I'd have skied it miles over the bar. Skilacci yeah. just puts it in beautifully, doesn't he? Bon is off don't. balance, isn't he? And he's fallen the wrong way. So he's fallen away from the goal. Mm. So although the angle for Skilacci is not great, he has got mm. the whole goal to aim at. And yeah. with admirable calm, he puts it right a, 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 across. It's, it's, a, it's a great to, finish. What we used to call a plomb. And um, it, it's... I, it, it's funny, actually, you're looking at, I know we're, we're going to talk a lot about Scalacci because we're speaking in, you know, shortly after his um, untimely death. And he, the, the, the thing about what's reminded me watching some of that World Cup again is he was playing on so much adrenaline in that tournament. Mm. He really was. And every little touch he made. I mean, he has a couple of layoffs in the game that are divine. Yeah. Um, and he was getting, he was coming, peeling off for balls and, he, and and getting there first. And he was only five foot eight. I'd forgotten how small he was. Very small for a, for a, you know, an all round centre forward. He was. And uh, even the dog agrees with me on that. <laughs> yes, um, yes. It's, Didier, Didier Dogba, he's, he's really all the way. <laughs> and uh, oh, by the way, I was just reminded, uh, what, what was it you were talking about? Um, uh, a, a disappointing foreign name to English people. We're just remembering, I, I stayed in a hotel called the Marivant, Marivant in Mallorca. And I thought, what a fabulous name for a hotel. Until I realised it means sea and wind. <laughs> it's it's uh, slightly it's disappointing. Yeah. It's very unimaginative, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Anyway, sorry, we, that was, that was, that was, by the way. Hmm. Sorry, sorry, I've really. You know, it, Jack Charlton blamed the goal on yeah. his midfielder Kevin Sheedy because yes. Kevin Sheedy plays a long ball from the left, the left side of midfield. He plays a long ball to the feet of his striker John Aldridge. Uh -huh. And Jack Charlton's Island, they didn't do that. Mm. They, pl they, they played, if they were going to play it forward, it was into the channels to chase mm. behind yeah. the opposing defenders. Yes. Yeah. They're playing it to feet and getting a kind of Kenny Dalgleish figure to, to, to turn and spin with it. They didn't do none of that. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on this Island side? Because I'm, I'm going to alienate many people from that, that, uh -huh. that fair country now. I despise the Jack Charlton team. I just found yeah. them. I, I thought they were capable of more, and I think mm. the performance that they that they they came up with in in this Italy game is is proof of it. But if yes. you look at this World Cup, first there's the dreadful game played against England in a thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. Then there's the game against Egypt, which is one of the worst ninety minutes I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit of that Monty Python philosophers game when no one wants the ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Great, great game. Socrates, and, and, 
Yes, yes. Uh, and and Charlton, he had the gall to moan about Egypt's negative approach afterwards. He said, you know, they never wanted to come out and play against us. You know, <laughs> and how did, he, how did he get away with that? And then there was a Holland game, which is a disgrace. Because yeah. at the point that it's 1-1, and they're, they're, they're both, the result from the England game means they're both going to qualify, yeah. nothing else happens. Yeah. They, they, you know, we're just going to – and then there's the Romania game where uh, I thought R- Romania were the better side but couldn't score, and the Irish did it on a, on a, on a penalty shootout. So I was uh, genuinely worried because they hadn't won a game. Yeah. I was really worried that they were going to go all the way without winning a game. And Jack yeah. was really happy about this. He said, yeah, yeah. If, if the rules let us go all the way without winning a game, yeah. that's what we're going to do. And so I thought, please, please take this team away. Please. Mm. How, did, how did you, as, as an athlete of the game, um, Paddy, yeah, yeah. how did you feel yeah. about them? Yeah, I, I think everything you've said is, 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 is justifiable. Um, personally... I watched the rise of Ireland. Let's face it, 10 years earlier, Ireland had been a rugby country. Um, still is, of course, but uh, I mean, what happened in the Charlton years um, was, was fantastic for football in that it basically brought it to a, a new country. I know Ireland had produced great players and uh, Northern Ireland did well in 50, as far back as 1958 and so on, but they... Um, it was it was exciting to see this right. I, I believe that countries should have an indigenous manager, but I don't think it's true of emerging countries. And Ireland at that time were an emerging football country, so I think it was all right for them to to cheat and, and, and get a few English people and an English manager. Because Tony Cascarino. Well, Cascarino exactly. Who, who wasn't even eligible, as as we later found out. Yeah. That's <laughs> And, as as and, he confessed, yes, yeah, and uh, and Aldridge and, and and all the rest, Townsend, you know, and uh, I mean, but I think it's okay that that in, in that case. I mean, if Brazil had a an English manager or in, England had a Brazil manager, it'd be disgraceful. But I think that was okay. So that rule they broke, and I thought they were right. The aesthetic, the rule that you've got to be pretty. I don't know. I think that I think they were entitled to play in a different way. I don't see anything wrong with playing a long ball and, and, and playing your football from there. I don't see anything wrong with that. No, there's nothing wrong with it, but not everyone has to like it. I and mean, it's perfectly legitimate to play that way. But I think we're allowed to to have an opinion the, about it. Oh, yeah. well, obviously, yeah. you are. And you're not wrong, as Paddy says, Tim, but isn't the beauty of the World Cup and these international tournaments that you're not necessarily supposed to like the football, but you can get other things from it. For Ireland, as we've already intimated, are the much smaller nation, not just geographically and um, population-wise, but also football-wise. Yeah. And within that, you have to find a culture. And I think this is a point that Jack Charlton was making. You have to find a point, uh, your comfort zone, uh, yeah. For which in, which in in which you play against a certain team, the difference yeah. between Ireland and uh, Italy in this game, because Ireland had their chances. John Aldridge had a really decent chance uh, mm. uh, of a headed goal, for example. Mm. Um, was that Scalacci, who we're talking about, was a finisher, mm. whereas Ireland didn't really look like that they were going to penetrate the Italian defence. I never, never did, imagined them scoring a goal. Exactly. Never imagined them scoring exactly. a goal. Yeah. So they've got to find a different way of playing, haven't sure, they? No, they I, I agree. I agree. And that, that it, and it is, if, if you're a Paraguay or an Ireland, it is, it is valid. Um, yeah. But, you, also, but it's, also, it's, it's hard for the new, it's a hard watch for the neutral though, isn't it? Yes. No, I, 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 I totally agree with that. Except the only thing I would say, and, and, and it's, 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 I'm sort of, wondering if I'm being a devil's advocate, really. But I, well, I tell you what I miss. I watched the European, we're speaking in 2024, I watched the European Championship, as I'm sure everybody did. And I saw, 20, what was it, 24 countries. 23 played exactly the same. The only team that played a different style was Scotland, who played a style called shite. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and, and got what they did. But all the other teams played the same way, very methodical, working into wide positions, uh, cutbacks. Uh, you know, basically you knew exactly what was going to happen in every attack. And uh, I kind of do slightly pine for the days, well, when, you know, European football was in its infancy in, in, in Britain and you had teams Honved or, 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 or um, uh, uh, you know, other, other teams coming to England and looking like creatures from a different planet. And Cullis, the Wolves manager, who was, you know, were often the hosts of the of the best of these games, watering his pitch to make it difficult <laughs> for for the foreigners' close passing game. And in, in, in other words, for it to be, uh, you know, very very different. I used to be, you used to be able to tell, and Tim will know exactly what I mean. You saw a Brazilian footballer; he knew it could only be Brazilian. For a start, he would take the ball in his chest. You know, he would he would love chest control, um, and that and somehow and, and they had that lopy walk, you know, that and only Brazilians had that flexibility. And now I watch Brazil, and they don't look much different from North Macedonia. <laughs> you know, I mean, occasionally a little bit, but uh, I quite liked, and I suppose watching Ireland in that tournament was a, a reminder of the days when when there were different ways of playing football. And and I think it's become much more homogenized now. And although it's probably better, more attractive now, it was quite nice just when things when when teams were different and reflected different cultures. Although I that this was one of the arguments that was going on in Ireland at the time. That this yeah. was an this was an English way of playing. This was it was this, it was it, yeah. that had nothing to do with the tradition of Ireland. Uh, yeah. I've got I've got some. It's a it's a fabulous little piece that the great Roddy Doyle wrote, yeah. Irish author in, yeah. in 1993. And there's things here that that really I think get to the heart of the matter. And the first, this is his reflections on the final whistle. Mm -hmm. It was one of the great times of my life when I love being from Dublin and I love being Irish. Three years later, it still fills me. The joy and the fun and the pride, adults behaving like children, Packy Bonner gritting his teeth, being able to cry in public, getting drunk in daylight, the t-shirts, the color, Mick McCarthy's long throw, the songs, the players, Paul McGrath, the excitement and madness and love. It's mm. all still in me and I'm starting to cry again. Yeah. And that, that, that's lovely. That that that's what yeah. you know. What the, the the collective experience that football can give you. On the yeah. other hand, in the same article, he talks about Eamon Dunphy. Eamon Dunphy was a very good footballer, especially with Millwall, uh, mm. an Irish international and a very interesting pundit. Although you you might not always agree with him, but he's got an opinion. And uh, Eamon Dunphy criticised the side, especially after the the mm. dreadful draw, draw with um, with Egypt. He yeah. threw his pen down on the on on the table and said he was ashamed. Yeah. And uh, and and in, in this article, Roddy Doyle writes, "It was simple, but ugly. You were either pro Charlton and anti Dumphy, or the other way around. Neutrality wasn't acceptable. No interest in football wasn't an excuse. The football didn't matter. You had to be for one or the other. Him versus him. Yeah. I was a Charlton man. And then <laughs> when when they score." In Holland, the whole bar is is chanting Eamon Dumphy is a wanker. And <laughs> that I, I find that troubling. It, it, that, that, well, I see. I, I, know, I'm kind of immune to the big forces of either religion or nationalism. I don't really understand them. Uh -huh. But w w what worries me about that? It's almost like a fascist thing, where uh -huh. you're you're obliged to support a way of playing that you might not like, but you go uh -huh. along with it anyway. I, 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 that but would trouble me. It, isn't it as a spectator or as a fan, isn't it that somebody's trying to rip the joy out of you? Like the, the first quote from Roddy Doyle that you had there has the euphoria of being a fan. And yeah. what what's wrong with being able to be, act like a kid again and get drunk in daylight and all of those things? Then somebody comes along and says, no, I'm going to piss all over your party. <laughs> no, you're not having it, are you? You're just like... You know, you tell them where to go. I, yeah. I understand no, he's a, what he's saying. Let him have an opinion. But, but yeah. 
Tim, it's like, you know, you said, um, oh, I missed what you said. I can't quote you back. It was but... rubbish anyway. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, you said <laughs> you said it was rubbish anyway. But um, I, the nearest team to me, as you know, is uh, Barnet, who have been in the fourth tier. When you go and see Barnet, you don't expect the silky yeah. skills. Even if Edgar Davids is playing for Barnet, you expect to see, not just from Barnet, but from the opposition, a kick and run. That, that's mm. dribbling in the fourth uh, tier. They kick it just wide of where you can reach it and then they run as fast as they can to get the ball and then they hoof it in cross it into the penalty box as soon as they can and hopefully somebody's there to bang it in or to or or, or, or to roll it in or however they get it in you're not expecting to see and i think that's partly how i don't know what you think patrick but that's Mm. partly why uh italy had it so or it was made so difficult for Italy because they weren't quite able to deal with the uh, the hard tackles that were flying in. They weren't quite able to deal with the way that Ireland approached the game. Mm. Even uh, There was a look, there was one tackle that Roberto uh, Baggio was felled in and you could see his face like, you know, yeah. hang on, I'm Roberto Baggio. Well, actually you're not. You're just in <laughs> opposition in this game. <laughs> That's true. I think, uh, yeah, I would draw um, a, a, a distinction between uh, tactical fouling, if, if you like, or, uh, you know, strategic fouling, which is, you know, as old as the hills, but um, but certainly Ireland did, did practice it. I would, I would actually stress that, you, you know, Wimbledon, who were, you know, the Ireland, if you like, of uh, English football. Good comparison. Of, of domestic English football. They were dirty. And uh, Ireland, I don't think were they weren't certainly were. I agree. As blatant, I agree. As blatant with it, and uh, so I think there's a difference there. And I would say that the, the Ireland tactics against Italy were actually pretty good. I don't think they played crass football. There's no law that says you can't hit crosses for a big centre forward if sure, he's sure. half, half a, uh, a yard taller than there is. That, that's the thing I find frustrating about them that you watch them in this game and you think mm. this side was capable of more. I know that's a very cruel thing to say about Jack's Ireland because he got them to places that they'd never been before and he's love for it. Yeah. But you, you, you see the performance against Italy and you think, this team can play. They, they, yeah, they could. I mean, they, they played uh, football uh, four years later against uh, against Italy in, in, in the United States. In New you know, York, that, yeah. That was, that was a good football match, actually. Um, against, I mean, maybe not quite as good an Italy team, but uh, you know, still but they still beat them. And, well, yes, and, and I'll, I'll never forget. But watching Paul McGrath, you know, uh, in that game, I mean, what a great footballer he was uh, in any posi- in, in either position, whether whether he was at the back, in a back four, a back three, or in midfield, he was just a fantastic footballer. But anyway, that's digressing. No, I think that. That, I agree with Tim. I think that the, the performance against Italy, in their way, proved that they were a legitimate football team. Yeah. I mean, I love I love these teasing balls that are designed to pull the centre back out of position, and or or mid or designed to make him run backwards, or you know, and watch over his shoulder. I think that's football. That's part of football. I love it. I don't think you have to play it to feet all the time. I mean, I, I, I admire by uh, Guardiola ball. You know, of course. Who doesn't? But, you know, I, I like I like a bit of a change as well. Were you there? <laughs> Obviously, you're, you're you're there in the stadium in a, in a professional capacity. Yeah, yeah. How much so of a Celtic? How much of a Celtic alliance was going on there? Were you none, were you none, support none. none at all? No, I I um, I was. I don't feel any Celtic alliance. Uh, bloody Welsh moaners every time Scotland beat them. <laughs> Uh, you know, no, I don't. I do. Obviously, I prefer them to England. I mean, if, 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 if anybody, if any Ireland teams play in England, I support an Irish I'm an Irishman then, or if Wales are moaning. Others. But I mean, I, I still support them against England. I'd support uh, the war crimes 11 against England. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> the um, sorry, that was bad for me. Oh, yeah, <laughs> let's leave Nuremberg to one side. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, actually, they were a good side, Nuremberg. I remember oh, yes. in the UEFA Cup, but then no, the, the um, uh, no, it, it's just I don't know, I didn't feel any Celtic alliance, but um, I did. I did think Ireland were a very likable team off the field as well as, you know, the, the atmosphere around them. They were very much at one with the support. They would, unlike England, who would stay, always stay in great, uh, you know, five-star, out-of-the-way places, patrolled by security and so on, in the middle of nowhere. The Irish would stay in the same hotel as their fans. I remember you know, several occasions going back to to talk to people after games and you were having to fight your way through a crowd, you know, like it's like being on the cop, you know, with all the fans milling about the lobby. So there was a lot to like about them. Um, but uh, no, in terms of uh, aesthetic value, no. Oh, do, do you know who the Pope supported in this match? Uh, I didn't ask him. Um, <laughs> okay. I yeah, didn't even know who he was. Out, but you didn't ask him. I didn't know who he was, but uh, and I think vice versa. But um, they no, I I don't know who would the Pope have supported in that one. Uh, that would have to be Italy, because that's his, his local local team. Yeah, yeah. I, I suppose if it was Vatican against Italy, he'd be he'd support Vatican. Yeah, Vatican would obviously win. Okay, so the yeah. goal. Um, Scalacci's goal we've yeah, talked about. This is, a, this is another point that, Ro, that Roddy Doyle makes. He said, I was glad that it was Scalacci who got the goal. Yeah, yeah. Because everybody loved Scalacci. Yeah. But there was something about his little, his manner, the fact that he was on the short side. The, he played with a smile on his face and, and, and passion, tremendous passion. Um, he was also quite good looking, wasn't he? He was quite sort of, in, in a sort of little man way, you know, he was, he was glamorous anyway. And he was, he, he had an every man quality about him with his, you know, perpetual motion and so on. Um, he was popular throughout the world, wasn't he? But oh, okay, only for a brief period. But I'm trying to think of other people who've dominated tournaments as, as he did. Um, uh, and I can't think of too many, well, apart from Pavarotti, I think he, you know, he was just the face of that tournament, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. He was. We're still going to talk about Pavarotti. Yeah. What? Why do you think that was, though, Tim? You you said that he had the game of the, or the month of his life, and it's a really nice way of putting it in tribute to Scalacci, the month of his life. And you think about the amount of things that have got to come together for you to have the month of your life, for you to up your game, if you like, at that precise moment. Mm -hmm. It's the undoing of many greats in football that they just can't put yeah. everything together for that month. Is there any thoughts and theories about oh, what happened with Scalacci? Partly it's opportunity because he's a kind of wild card anyway. He's only just getting in, getting into the squad and had everything gone to plan, had Viali and Mancini fired as they were firing for Sampdoria, he wouldn't have got a game. You know, yeah. he, he'd, he'd just been an unused member of the squad. But the first game, it was Austria. And you could feel the tension, you know, the, the burden of playing at home. Home in a World Cup can be an advantage or, yeah. and as Brazil found in 2014, it can be a dreadful impediment, yeah. carrying the weight of all, all, all of that. And yeah. the, the Viali Mancini thing, you could feel it in that first game. It's like panic in the stands. Yeah. And, and one of the great things about football is the people in the, in, in the stadium – help set the mood you know it it, it it transmits and and so that the coach Vicini is looking for his goal so he makes a change and he throws on Skilachi and Skilachi gets the goal and then he's away yeah but had yeah. everything gone to plan we'd never heard of him because he'd, he'd, he'd have been just a squad player the squad player yeah yeah and I mean I'm, I'm put in mind of you know remember Paolo Rossi and, yes. and oh, yeah, of course. you know, and and although he was a better, uh, probably you'd be remembered as a, a you know a class above Scalacci in terms of his career, but he wasn't going to be in that World Cup either, was he? 
he and came I, well he 82 he came he comes in at the last moment doesn't he because yeah. he's only just um unbanned he's been banned for his in, involvement yeah. in a bribe and scandal and, and in and the and first exactly. games he's fucking useless you yeah. know yeah. nothing yeah. from him at all and then really suddenly won. bang 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 and he wins the world cup and he was never the same again afterwards you know no. It, it, no, it, there is a similarity there yeah and and the other and the other i'm maybe stretching a point here but uh in fact i, I can feel that i am but the uh, i'm put in mind of uh, denmark at the european championship you know they weren't expected to be there they weren't yeah. fit. They were. They were. They had to drag themselves more or less off the beach. The manager got into trouble with his wife because he promised to use the summer to uh, fit a kitchen in his fit the kitchen in in his house. An and, IKEA. Uh, what? I An IKEA say. kitchen. Well, listen. I won't hear a word against them. I've never <laughs> had. A, I've never had a kitchen that wasn't IKEA, yeah. and I've never been let down. Oh Christ! It's just fallen down. Um, no, 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 no. Um, no, it's great stuff. And if it, you know, if I, IKEA want to uh, are listening and, and want to send me, a bit, <laughs> let the record state. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, exactly. I, it's uh, fifty six Thorn Street. Anyway, um, well, they came late to that tournament, and, and it, not for the first time, I was put in mind of: are the virtues of preparation overrated? You know, mm, mm. I mean, if you look at this World Cup, there was no preparation. They were playing for the clubs one day, uh, the Qatar World Cup I'm talking about. They were playing for the clubs one day and they went to the World Cup. Did the world end? Because those teams had not had any preparation? No. So that, that old saying, that the the, uh, the failure to prepare is preparing to fail. You're yeah. saying nonsense. Yes, I am. Well, I, well I'm, I'm saying nonsense, question mark. I, I do think there's a... I, I, I do think that, that preparation in football is, nowadays, when players are more or less playing all year round anyway, is highly overrated. I really do. And I wouldn't mind if every World Cup it, it, it had no preparation. It's murder for the players. There's only so many jigsaw puzzles you can do. What are your favourite? It does, yeah. What are your favourite memories of, the, of, of being in Italy for, the, for this World Cup? To be honest, the food. Um, yeah. But, you know, because it was, what, 34 years, 34, 34 years ago, food in England was not as... Rubbish. In, in Britain, was was not what it is today. You know, we talked before about homogenization. You know, you get the same, more or less the same food everywhere you go. But they pizza, usually. And, um, but in those days, you had to go to Italy for pizza. And uh, you know, fresh pasta I'd never tasted before. So I'm, I'm being slightly frivolous there. But the 1990 World Cup was not a good World Cup, was it? No, oh, and it, it, it wasn't it forced. It forced FIFA to crack down on the tackle from behind. Correct. Because it was the world. It's the World Cup with the lowest average goals there was. Yeah. So yeah. I thought we we have to do something to promote the quality of the spectacle. So. It was, uh, yeah. Was, yeah, I mean, was, obviously absolutely. English people have, have good memories of it because exactly. you know, England exactly. reached the semi-finals and yeah. the best games were involving England. You know, it was it was a yeah, football yeah. inside. The Belgium game was fantastic. The Cameroon absolutely. game was dramatic. The Germany semi-final was wonderful, but yeah. a lot of the other games were disappointing, weren't they? So English English people think it was a great World Cup. It wasn't. It was terrible. And as you rightly say, Blatter and uh, Latini actually design re help and, and others helped to redesign the game. They set Blatter set up something called Task Force two thousand. And it was a it was a, it was a wonderful thing. Well it was for me because they had people from all over the game and they they called them to a conference, two day conference in Stockholm. And I was I don't know why, I was chosen as the representative of written press. And uh, but there were representatives of every other part of the game, including players. And anyway, I went over there. It was quite an, it was quite instructive actually. It was a quite a good insight into uh, FIFA corruption actually, because I got they they paid me twice as much uh, expenses as I as I should have got. But anyway, that's that's by the by the by. Um, and 
it was one of the greatest moments of my life because there were people there like Platini, Beckenbauer, I think, was there. I think Cruyff was there. There was a referee called Dermot Gallagher, who's still going strong as a pundit now. He was there as the as the representative of the referees. There was a guy called Hansi Muller, who had been a player, you might remember, mm, played for it. Very, very fine attacking midfielder with the Germans. Yeah, splay footed. And he he was there as a representative of agents because he was a budding agent at the time. So there were people representing everybody and little old me. Anyway, we were we were taken out for a dinner on the, the only night I was there to a, a nobleman's house in on an island in off Stockholm. And while we were waiting for the boat to take us, we were all having a few beers in the hotel bar. And I promise you, this actually happened. I suddenly realized that I was the only person I hadn't bought around. So I quickly thought, well, the boat will be here in a minute. I'd better get my round in because I don't, I don't want to let these great start. So I said, right, uh, lads, is it another beer? Franz, Johan. Um, <laughs> this, is not, this is not a lie, Franz Johan. Who was that? Michelle? What's yours? Are you having another beer? Yeah. And so I bought a round for all these great people. And Dermot, because I remember Dermot Gallagher, the referee, was there. John Toshak was there, uh, representing managers, I think. And uh, so I bought this round for all these uh, all these superstars. And I remember I got that pissed that on the way. On the way back from this nobleman's uh, residence where we'd had dinner, I was actually, in slurred tones, I was prodding Platini in the chest and telling him, what you don't understand, Michel, is this. <laughs> I was lecturing fucking Platini on football. And it just brought <laughs> out the inner Glaswegian in you, didn't it? Uh, Londonian, but yes. Mm -hmm. Fair point. And also, we have to reimagine um, Glaswegians buying everybody a drink. We have to reimagine that one. What there about you? The hey, you, Michel. <laughs> hey, you. Probably you, Michel. It's, it's <laughs> Johan Varlikes. <laughs> <Pretty hell. laughs> it's Mr. Cruyff or Lord Cruyff to you and I. But yeah. we do look at the musical soundtrack um, to the iconic games that we talk about. So we're paying tribute to Toto Scalacci. Um, and the game was 30th of June, 1990, in Rome. Is it the Olympic Stadium yeah. um, or Stadium yeah. Olympica? Uh, yeah. Italy versus uh, Ireland. Italy won one nil. But it was Elton John that was in the number one position in the charts at the time. Mm -hmm. Sacrifice, healing hands mean anything to you, Patrick? Yeah, a, a good, uh, good straight up and down Elton John song, I would have thought. Um, I, I was I, I was never um, huge Elton John fan, but I, I think he's probably got over that. Yeah, yeah, he's gotten over it. He's, he's said to himself the other day. And I call him Elton, actually, but you know, um, I call him Reginald. Yeah, well, you would, wouldn't you? He hasn't gone by that name since he was in short trousers. What was, what was uh, number two? What well, number two is the interesting one, the song of the moment, I think it's fair to say, Luciano Pavarotti's Ness and Dorma, which oh, I played okay. just last night on request, by the mm. way, on the old uh, wireless. Um, for some reason that, well, it's between that and the number four song here in the mm. UK as to which is the, the number four song being World in Motion by New Order, as to mm. which is the ultimate World Cup song. What would you go for, Ness and Dorma or World in Motion? Well, it, it, I would go for Ness and Dorma, obviously. I mean, what's that? What uh, was that? I'm innocent. It's got to be That's something in Brazil, mate. Yeah, it's street, not... street sounds. It's it's the usual uh, two cars nearly colliding and then going heavy on the horns. Oh, yeah. Well, they've started doing that in England now. It's uh, a homogenization, mate. Indeed. Oh, yes. it it is. Is, yeah. Globalization, yeah. eh? Globalization. Um, Yep. It's Ness and Dorma for you, Tim. It's World in Motion. I don't like Ness and Dorma. I don't know. Oh, yeah. No, I just don't understand it. It's not, not my idiom. Whereas I think World in Motion is the greatest. It's the first time intelligence has been used with a football song. With all due respect to Chaz and Dave, because I love all of, the, all, 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 of the, all of their Tottenham ones. Oh, but yeah, they're great. Yeah. I think World in Motion is it's like a piece of art. Yeah. Can it you reminds me a little bit of that... Um, you know the the 
bit that I read out from the Paddy Doyle thing, uh, the uh, yeah, Roddy yeah. Doyle thing. Yeah. Uh, it, it, that conjures up world in motion conjures up some of some of those same feelings I, I, I don't ever remember a football song before or since thinking that's a work of art and i think world in motion is yeah so you, you didn't uh, you didn't feel that way about we are ron's 22 no no this time more than any other time this time yeah. yes no, bizarre bizarre song i do sing it in the shower from time to time yeah yeah. yeah, I don't know why it's just stuck in the brain. And talking of being drunk in Stockholm at number two, three, sorry, rock set with it must have been love. Uh, everybody are, loves that, don't they? Are they from mm. Are they from Stockholm or are they from Jordeberg? No, you're absolutely right. To actually, you're spot on. They're not from Stockholm. Uh, the guy uh, Per Gessley is from. Uh, it's near the south. I think it's Harland. It's not Gothenburg. Uh, Marie Fredrickson. Already Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, she's not from Yutabori because I would know Yutubori. from the accent. They've got a distinct yeah. accent. But she's from Score now. I'm pretty sure Marie Fredrickson. Late as she is now, she's passed um, way, way, way before her time. What about number five, Oops Up Snap, which is like the rebooting of rap music? Anybody interested? No. No takers on that? No. Okay, um, number eight, Maxi Priest, close to you. Unless Love you want him. to talk about the number seven, Mona by Craig McLaughlin, who was one of these guys from Neighbour. Yeah, I know, it's just a rip off of Willie and Hanjive, that one. But yeah, Maxi Priest, close to you, you love it. Paddy, any thoughts? Uh, no, I, honestly, I'm not going to be very helpful on this because I, I, I don't want to sound, uh, you know, uh, virtuous or anything, but. Uh, Honestly, all the time when I was at World Cups or in World Cups years, or in, when I was working as a football reporter, I thought of nothing else. Mm. I was just totally absorbed in football. If I wasn't watching a game, I wouldn't be listening to music or watching the telly. I'd be reading World Soccer or I'd be watching a game on the box. Or So I'm, I'm absolutely, for 40 years, music became nothing to me. Really. How, how, how do you feel about that in retrospect? Do you think that you exaggerated? Yeah. I think I wish I had my life to live again. I would, I would, I would have made it more, made my life more diverse and not given so much to football. Uh, sorry, that uh, it's a terribly um, deep and rather gloomy answer to a bloody interesting question but um i i would uh, i would definitely not i don't think i got back what i put into football and that sounds uh, selfish and, and gloomy and, and and all that but i think i gave too much it, it's reflective isn't it it's not that it's so much gloomy although there's an edge of gloom about it but mm. it's um it's yeah reflecting on uh, one's life yeah I don't think you'll be the only one who feels like you put more into mm. something than you got out yeah. of it. But you also yeah. gave a lot of pleasure. Yeah, um, and it, it, that, that kind of commitment, you could clearly see that in the quality of, of, of your of your work. And mm. I remember the first the first time we met, which was in the Maracanã for a yep. Brazil Argentina game in ninety yeah. shortly before the World Cup. That I was, remember uh, having the uh, Veron was playing. That's it. That's it. it Ran the good. show. He was the, the best player on the field, yeah. He yeah. was, yeah. And I remember having the pleasure of telling you that you were one of the I'm most one of the ones that I'm most respected. Thank so you. you 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 could really tell it from the quality of your work. I suppose one question is, you know, the line is it a Kipling line? What do you know of England who only England knows? Yeah. Mm. Uh, is do you think that maybe you could have been a different journalist and perhaps in some ways an even better one had you mm. stepped away? gone into other things and then brought that back into your football journalism uh, yeah yes I do that's that's sort of more or less um, what what I, what it was but I, the other thing Tim is to, to be fair I was a bit of a lazy bastard There's, there was there was nothing I liked better and still don't than a comfort zone you know and I suppose I remember at one stage I did ask did you ever know my old sports editor Charlie Burgess, who no. was with? Well, he was my. It was, I had great sports editors. Well, until I went to the Times, 
and uh, <laughs> I had the opposite. But uh, the I, Charlie was one. Was one of the, and, and at one stage, I wanted to be. Do, 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 you'll you'll be familiar with the great uh, sports writer Matthew Engel, mm-hmm. and uh, he uh, made his name on cricket and then diversified into other things and. And I remember going in to see Charlie and saying, you know, I want to, I want to go to different sports and do different things. I want to be more like Matthew Engel. And Charlie says, Paddy, you're not Matthew Engel. Now let's go and have a drink. And that was the end. Of it. And from then on, I, uh, I, uh, I just concentrated on fo- on football. And actually, I, 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 it sounds ridiculous to complain because when you've done what I've done and and I've watched all through the careers of Diego Maradona and Leo Messi. I've watched them from being teenage boys. Uh, I saw them both first play when they were 18, just going on 19. And and to have watched them right to the end of their careers. So, you know, it was a, a, you know, and the funny thing is, this, this is what, this is one bloody regret I've got. And I think it says a lot about the media. I'm the, maybe the only person, one of the few people in the world, who's seen those two great players, Argentine players, play for, you know, all of their clubs and their countries in, you know, dozens, in, in loads of World Cups and, and multiple stages. And you know that the only, the, you know, I get asked, what do you think of the motor racing? You know, and, and, and you know, I don't know. I couldn't give a shit about the motor racing. And nobody has ever asked me about Messi or Maradona. What's your impressions having seen them all through your career? But, you know, that's just the way the media are. Well, my next question is, what's your impression of uh, Messi and Maradona, Patrick? Um, (laughs) You you, you managed to see them throughout their careers. I'm not sure. I, I just, I'm just not sure. <laughs> but, but do you remember who first asked you that question? Please yeah. don't forget that. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, I, obviously, I know that the quality of the questions on this program is going to be better than thank you the, the media as a whole. And, uh, but no, of course, Maradona was in a class of his own, the best player I ever saw, and uh, and he played. If Lionel Messi had had to play with players trying to break his legs every minute of every day. Uh, I don't think he'd have achieved as much as he did. And thank God to uh, Blatter and Platini for making mm. sure that mm. he, that Messi did not have to play, play under the conditions Maradona did. Mm. There are some tunes. It's a great, it's a, it's a great in... point. You're, sorry, sorry. But it, that, it's a great point. And for all of Blatter's faults, and you mentioned seeing the FIFA corruption, yeah. close yeah. Yeah. and it was corruption as a as a as a as an mo if you like yeah. it's the way it's, it's the way it worked yeah. but for all of those faults there was still at the heart of it uh yeah. the decisions that were made quite often benefited the game and yeah. the, the crackdown on, on the tackle from behind there's no doubt that that's one of the yeah. big things that came in and yeah. it massively benefited the game and as you said i think it might have been you it was either you or huey mack who told mm. us about tommy doherty yeah, at the start of of Messi's career, asking he was asked what he thought about Messi, and he said a few years ago he'd have had to take a note from his mum <laughs> just to be allowed onto the field because it, it was it was just would have been too dangerous for him, you know, for for, for someone like that. That would so, be Michael Danny. I'd love to own it. <laughs> it's yours. Take it away. I was going to say that there are some tunes that even if you've got no interest in music that just permeate the landscape, yeah, yeah. Um, whether you're concentrating on football in the World Cup or otherwise. Well, we know one of Paddy's a rocker. We, we've, we found that yeah. out from, well, yeah, he's a bit of a headbanger. ACDC, where would I have liked to have been? Uh, the uh, ACDC live in River Plate. Yeah, yeah, that's not a bad one. There are some nods, there. there are some noise nods to what the, um, the Swedish like to call Iron Maiden. Uh, Bruce Dickinson's <laughs> yeah. in there at number 23 with all the young dudes. Poison's uh-huh. in there with Unskinny Bop. And there's one or two others. But what I, what I was going to say was that number 13 is a tune that completely was the tune of 1990. Um, you can't touch this. 
yeah, I can actually. I'm going to touch mm-hmm. it twice. <laughs> you see if, if you like it or not. But um, beginning of 1990, I went to live in Los Angeles, and within I went to write for the newspaper in Los Angeles. And within about two weeks of my being there, they wanted to send me up to Oakland to interview this young rapper called MC Hammer. So I yep. flew up there, did the interview, etc. And then even before the plane touched back down in Los Angeles, he was the biggest thing in certainly in California, within a week, probably in the United States, within a month, right across the world. Um, mm-hmm. Surely, surely, surely you have heard of bum, 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 You can't touch this. <laughs> yes, I have heard of that. Thank and you. A very, a very good rendition, by the way. But I was, interest, I was very interested to hear um, as you told that story, how just one interview from you can transform a career. <laughs> yes. there, there are many he's others. Still get, he's still getting the checks from from. from I'll, I'll tell you. I'll, I'll you. tell you what, Tim. If he can do for us what he did for <laughs> MC Hammer. Indeed. Remember, it blew up before I touched back down to Los Angeles to write the article. You know what we music journalists are like? We don't have the same pressure as you sports journalists to file the copy in before we get on the plane. So it was whilst I was in the air thinking, oh, that guy was all right, he's not all that, uh, that he became all that and all right for everybody. But it, it, it just fits in with Scalacci, isn't it? Because Scalacci had that month yeah. when you couldn't touch him. Mm-hmm. Just that month. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it fits in with. Sorry, Paddy. No, no, I was just, I was just mm, saying mm, in agreement. Uh, I'm just trying to think of. Uh, you know, I remember Bernd Schuster when he was 19, dominating a European Championship, but never. No, never quite. Uh, uh, apart from Maradona in '86, Platini at the European Championship of '84. You know, there aren't many players who have just grabbed a tournament by the scruff of the neck like that. If You Can't Touch This by MC Hammer was the theme to our, you know, our topic today, um, paying tribute to Toto Scalacci. If MC Hammer's You Can't Touch This was his tune, then you'd have to go to number 38 to find um, Ireland's tune and indeed St. Jack's tune, um, written by the perhaps, you know, greatest rock band to come out of Ireland since Thin Lizzy, um, mm. which is U2. I still haven't found what I'm looking for, but this version is by The Chimes. Uh, Bono has uh, stated for the record that he feels that this this version um, is better than their own version. Right. And, it feel, it feel, yeah, and it feels like a kind of a spiritual experience, Ireland yeah. in the World Cup, taking on Italy, to a certain extent, and it's something of a gospel vibe about it. But at the end of the day, just like England after 66, Ireland, as Scotland as well, we're all in the territory of the number 79 record in the charts. Ooh. Oh, 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 let me Ooh. scroll down. I can't wait to get there. I can't oh, believe you've yes. got no, I can't no, believe no, it. No, 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 no. You, are, hang on hang a gonna, second. you are getting hang divorced now. You are getting no, divorced. Hang on if a you... second. I, one second. When I went through the charts, I clearly saw that my wife was in the charts. Don't get me wrong. And if you're looking at the number 79, Paddy, my yeah. wife is not Courtney Pine. It's, um, <laughs> just because the song is I'm Still Waiting, a cover of the Diana Ross classic by yeah. Courtney Pine, the jazz saxophonist, and yeah. my missus, um, Queen of Lovers, Carol, Carol, Thompson. Carol Thompson. It's a beautiful uh, version of a wonderful song. It's beautifully oh, sung, it's beautifully played. It's a right. wonderful song. That's, I, 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 I that's was going to be my post uh, match um, entertainment today. Yeah. Well, Actually, if you don't mind, let me send you her latest song, Paddy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I will send it to you by post now. It's on um, Spotify and all of these things. I'll, I'll send it nice. to you by email, uh, which lovely. is um, a tune called September. And it, if you listen carefully, it might be the metaphor to the perhaps regrets that you have about concentrating too much on football because... Oh. Uh, September is used as a metaphor for um, the autumn, for the... yeah, for the autumn of our lives. After long, what summer just passed us by. 
Exactly. Yeah. Oh, you like it, Tim. I'm glad to hear. It's my favourite song of hers. She's written a blinder in that one. She didn't yeah. write I'm Still Waiting, but she wrote September, and I'll send it off to you as well. You know, you, you know when uh, coming on this uh, brilliant show, I, I they told me uh, your huge team of uh, greeters and researchers told me that it's called the Brazilian shirt name. I didn't know the actual title is In the Psychiatrist's Chair. <laughs> well it's the brazilian shirt name in the psychiatrist there's one long thing so we thought we'd abbreviate it oh, did yes, we you never could just lie that? down no. now and tell me about your childhood <laughs> yes yeah indeed do you, do you remember in the psychiatrist chair with dr anthony clare i remember it yes he, he was a fantastic it. broadcaster as indeed you are but uh well, uh, we all are. We all are. Yeah. We all are. You know, those of us who have spent a bit of time doing broadcasting, we become good, don't we, eventually? Um, look, it's an absolute pleasure, Patrick. We don't speak enough, actually, so well, let's make it even more regular. Yes, and please. your anecdotes are beyond comparison, but your memories of this game and your conversation through it, 1990, Ireland versus Italy, will live on. It's legendary now, now that you've spoken to Tim Vickery about it. It'll stay there in the annals of football time forever and ever and ever. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tim, Thank you. And uh, honestly, let's, you know, let's have a drink, a drink, a drink to mm -hmm. Toto Scalacci because I yeah. think he, in his glorious month, he has given us all something to aim for as well. So good, good on him. Thank you.